Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Lichens 101 webinar with Kendall McDonald. My name is Beverly James. I am the Preserve Director here at Flora Cliff Nature Sanctuary, and we are hosting uh, this series of webinars. Uh, this is our seventh and final webinar for 2020. Uh, we do plan on having some other webinars um, and through the winter we have some scheduled for uh, January, March and uh, April of next year so encourage you all to be on the lookout for those. Uh, for those of you that have not been to Flora Cliff before just going to start with a brief introduction of uh, where we are and what we do. Uh, Flora Cliff is a 346 acre nonprofit uh, nature sanctuary and state nature preserve in Fayette County, uh, just south of Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, we are in the Kentucky River Palisades region and Elk Lake Creek is the main tributary that runs through Flora Cliff, which is the creek that you see in the background here. Uh, we were founded by Dr. Mary Wharton, who is a botanist, author, and professor at Georgetown College. Uh, she started purchasing Flora Cliff in the late 50s, and it took her 30 years to acquire 287 acres. And a few years before she passed away, uh, she set up the nonprofit, um, and she specified that Flora Cliff be open for guided hike only with an emphasis on education and research and be used for inspiration and recreation only when keeping the area unspoiled. So her wishes guide everything that we do today. We focus on protecting, restoring, and sharing nature in the bluegrass. Uh, with protecting uh, nature, the land that uh, Mary Wharton acquired is now a dedicated state nature preserve. Uh, so it's been a state nature preserve since 1996, and that's the highest level of land protection in Kentucky. Uh, we also acquired um, another tract, a 59 acre tract in 2017 called the Trails End Tract, and that is protected through a conservation easement with the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund. Um, in addition to protecting the land, we feel that it's important to know uh, what we're protecting. So we work with uh, researchers in the region and we also do a lot of community science to um, understand the ecology and the biodiversity that's at Flora Cliff. So we do a lot of surveys uh, to know the plants and the wildlife and the fungi and um, of course the lichens uh, that are at Flora Cliff. And, um, we have a stewardship director, Josie Miller, who's assisting in the background tonight. Um, so she leads all of our restoration work um, at Flora Cliff. Uh, we've been managing invasives since 2000 to uh, make the forest and the habitats there um, as healthy as they can be. So we have a lot of invasives like bush honeysuckle and garlic mustard and emerald ash borer that we're currently managing at the moment. And we have a team of volunteers that help us with that work. With sharing the sanctuary, in a typical year, we have about 1,200 visitors who attend a variety of guided hikes and workshops and programs. Uh, this year, we had to close down a little bit and the webinars um, are new for us, um, but we've had hundreds of people attending our webinars this year. And uh, we thank all of you for attending tonight for um, making this a successful uh, series for us. So this map just shows um, where we're located. So we're here between uh, the Kentucky River and I-75 um, and the Palisades region is characterized by uh, steep topography. So you see that there along the ravines of Elk Lake Creek and then there uh, along the river. And so that es essentially protected the sanctuary from development um, and uh, also um, influences the types of habitats and plants and things that are found um, here at the sanctuary. You know, we do have a couple of facilities. We have a nature center um, and a lodge that we also use for programs. And some of the main features we have at Flora Cliff that people come to see, uh, we have Elk Lake Falls here on the top left. Uh, this is a 61 foot waterfall. It's also a tufa formation. It's one of the largest tufa formations uh, in the region, uh, which is basically uh, has formed like a stalactite or a stalagmite wood, except it's external. Uh, we have a pretty fantastic wildflower display in spring from late March through uh, mid to late April. And we have some of the oldest known trees in Kentucky. Uh, we have 10 chinkapin oaks that date to the 1600s. This one here dates to 1611, and it's only 24 inches in uh, diameter, um, but it's the oldest documented cross-dated tree in Kentucky. So for tonight's webinar, uh, we do want you to know that we are using the Zoom webinar feature. Um, so it's a little bit different than meetings. Um, only the speaker and the panelists uh, have audio and video controls. Um, so by default, uh, we cannot see or hear uh, the rest of you, the attendees. 
um, to ask a question, uh, we ask that you use the Q&A feature found either at the top or bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, questions can be submitted at any time and uh, they will be answered at designated pauses during or after the presentation. Um, there is a feature where we can allow you to speak if you would prefer to speak your question uh, rather than type it in, um, but maybe just let us know through the Q&A feature um, that you would like to speak. Uh, we've practiced with that recently, so we think we can do that without any uh, complications and it won't turn on your video, it will just turn on your audio. For general comments, we ask that you use the chat feature um, and we do want you to know that the webinar um, is being recorded and a video link will be emailed uh, to all participants next week. So for tonight's webinar, uh, we have Lichens 101 with Kendall McDonald. And we first met Kendall um, back in 2017 uh, when we were attending a lichen workshop offered by um, Dr. Alan Risk at Moorhead State University. And Kendall was a student of his and a teaching assistant. Um, and since then, she has helped with uh, lichen surveys at Flora Cliff. She also led a hike for us uh, last winter, uh, the Winter Greens hike, which featured lichens and mosses and ferns that can be uh, viewed and appreciated during uh, the winter time. Um, and Kendall's a very passionate teacher. Um, she's, a, she's also, of course, a botanist with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserve. So we're thrilled to have her here tonight to share her um, passion and knowledge about lichens. So Kendall, I'll turn it over to you so you can start screen sharing. Okay, hi everyone. Um, give me a second to take over uh, the controls here. Okay. So, um, like she said, I'm Kendall McDonald. I'm with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Um, and today we're going to talk uh, about the basics of lichens, Lichen 101. So, the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves, um, these are all of our statutes. Um, and instead of reading all of this, we'll uh, look at some pretty pictures to explain what we do at Nature Preserves. So this is a map of all of uh, the properties that Nature Preserves has. Uh, we conserve natural areas through the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund, the Wild River System and state uh, nature preserves programs. We have um, over 120,000 acres um, of land across the state that we help conserve. Um, on those lands, we uh, do invasive uh, removal and treatment. We do habitat management for rare and endangered species. We're involved in prescribed fire um, and lots of other land management activities. Um, biological assessment, um, we recognize, conserve, manage um, rare and endangered plant species. And we are also the clearinghouse um, of data for all the environment, plants and animals that are native to Kentucky. So we also have um, a goal of reaching out to all of our wonderful people who live in Kentucky and the surrounding states um, through environmental education and recreation. We promote the scientific and spiritual value of an unspoiled environment. We house all of our information in the Kentucky Natural Heritage Database, um, which includes over 20,000 records um, on the over 900 species that we track. And you can access all of that through the Kentucky Biological Assessment Tool or the KBAT online. So now we'll get um, onto my presentation. Um, so something I get a lot when I tell people that I um, studied lichens in undergrad at Moorhead State University, usually they ask me, what are lichens? So um, we'll start there, we'll start at the basics. So, hmm, we're gonna talk about what lichens are and also what they are not. There's a lot of misconceptions about things that are lichens, what lichens are. So 
we're gonna clear that all up for everyone. So lichens are composite organisms, and that means uh, that they're made of two or more components that depend on one another. These components can live by themselves independently, but when they're together, they make a completely new organism that functions differently than if they lived separately. So the components of a lichen we know are um, fungi and algae. So this can be fungi and green algae. It can be um, fungi and cyanobacteria, um, or that's also called blue algae. Um, and some lichens have both green and blue. And there's a lot of new research um, that there might be new components uh, to lichens besides these two um, traditional components. There might be yeast involved. There might be different kinds of fungi. Um, but research continues. Um, lichens are one of the uh, cooler fields. Uh, I might be a little bit biased. One of the cooler things to study because we don't know uh, that much about them yet. There's a lot to discover. So what lichens are not? Um, here are a lot of things people will post pictures or you know ask about something or well, what lichen is this? And um, turns out it's, it's not a lichen, um, which is fine. I'm just glad people are looking at anything outside, but um, just want you guys to know what a lichen isn't. So they're not mosses, they're not liverworts, hornworts, um, they're not fungi, and they're not algae. Um, and those last two that might sound uh, a little bit confusing because I just said that lichens are fungi and algae. But um, when fungi or algae is living independently by itself, um, it's not considered a lichen. So when they're together, we have a lichen, but when they're separate, they're not. So that's a lot of um, not so fun stuff. But uh, there's this cute little story. I did not write this. Um, we're gonna have a little story time about lichens. Uh, hopefully this will help you um, remember uh, what goes into a lichen and what the relationship is of those components. So um, gather around the campfire kids. Um, so lichens start with the story of Alice Algae and Freddie Fungus. Freddie Fungus was an excellent carpenter, but he wasn't a very good cook. In fact, he couldn't even make his own food. Just like all fungi, he had to search for dead plants or animals to eat, and sometimes he went hungry. One day, while Freddie Fungus was looking for food, he followed a tempting aroma to a rundown house. Inside was the cook responsible for the delicious smell, Alice Algae. Seeking an opportunity to trade his skills for food, Freddie Fungus offered to fix up her house, and Alice agreed. After spending a lot of time together, Freddie Fungus and Alice Algae inevitably took a lichen to each other. And from then on, Freddie Fungus built the house and Alice Algae would make the food and they lived happily ever after. So while Freddie and Alice may have been in love, um, the scientific word for this relationship is symbiotic. So the algae uh, in this scenario provides the food for the lichen through photosynthesis and fungus provides the structure. Um, so what does this look like um, in real life and not in stories? Um, it turns out it's not just a jumbled up bag of um, fungal bits and algae. Um, it comes out in this more layered kind of structure so you can see this photo on the right here. This is a cross section of a lichen. So basically imagine like you have a loaf of bread and you sliced it. Um, this would be one of the slices, except this is super tiny and they put it under um, a microscope. So you can see we get this really nice uh, layered structure with an upper and lower cortex. Those are also fungal parts. They're just, um, the cells are very tightly uh, pressed together so they create a protective covering and then in the middle you have this fungal layer 
Um, it's also called the medulla or the mycobiont. Um, and that's a more loose fungal structure, not so tightly packed um, together because it's not providing as much protect protection. And then right below the upper cortex, uh, you'll see a nice layer of algae. And um, obviously it's towards the surface, so it can uh, get the energy from the sun it needs to photosynthesize. So that's um, generally how a lichen looks and we'll get a little more into the details. So, so far, are there any questions? I haven't seen any come in yet. Does anyone want to put a question in the box? We'll answer two or three here. So the story says yes. So I think a question is coming. Okay. And story, let us know if you uh, want to say your question out loud. Okay, so she says yes. Okay, give us just a second. Oh, there you are, I'm out to talk. Okay, so Story, I think you can be on at any minute. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so let me make sure I understand this right. Lichen is not like an individual organism. It's a symbiotic relationship. So it's not even like, that is so bizarre. You're shaking your head yes, like that's what it is. It's not an organism. It's not like moss or a fungus, it's a colony. Weird. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So a, um, a way to look at it is um, lichens are fungus that discovered agriculture. Um, so yes, the, the species of fungus and the species of algae can live apart, but when they come together, they make a completely new organism and a completely new species. Okay, I think I got it. Thank you. Yay. Anyone else? You can also raise your hand if you want to uh, ask a question out loud. All right, looks like that's it for now. Oh, oh. Lynn says, um, are there equal parts? Um, I wouldn't say that they're equal parts. Uh, it's not like a 50-50 um, relationship. It's not 50% algae, 50% fungus. Um, I don't know that there is an exact ratio. Um, I think it might just differ by species and structure. All right, that looks like that's it for now. Okay, uh, we'll go on to the next section. Good questions. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about um, lichen growth forms and coloration. So there are many different types of lichens if you look this up. Um, but we're just going to focus on the four main types. Um, so that's this crustose, folios, fruticose, squamulose um, growth forms. Um, so I kind of made these little drawings, uh, little diagrams to help you guys see um, the layers. Because really with lichens, they're so small um, and they, they operate on such a small scale that you have to um, really look at the microscopic level to define the different growth forms. So you're gonna see these diagrams more. They're not to scale or anything. They're just to help facilitate understanding. Um, but throughout the whole thing, orange is gonna represent um, our cortex, which is the fungal element for protection, tightly packed cells. Uh, Green is gonna represent our algae layer. Uh, this tan is gonna represent our fungal layer. 
and this gray is going to represent um, our substrate or um, just the material the lichen is growing on. So the first one we're going to talk about is folios, just because um, it has all of the components of a lichen, all the layers. Um, so all of these photos are various kinds of folios lichens. Um, and if you look at my the little diagram I made up in the upper right corner, um, you can see that we have an upper and a lower cortex that's defined. Um, and we have an algal layer and a fungal layer that's also defined. Um, folios lichens are the only lichens that have a distinct different upper cortex and lower cortex. Um, no other growth form will have uh, both and they're very uh, different from one another. They'll have a leaf lobe like appearance. Um, these lichens can be so small that they're smaller than a dime. Um, and I've seen them be as larger than dinner plates um, in places like the mountains. Um, besides getting microscopic, another way to um, easily ID these is can you easily separate it from what it's growing on? Um, so if you could just take a knife or a chisel or something and prop it right off of its substrate, um, it's probably a folios lichen. The next growth form we're gonna talk about is crustose. So again, these are all pictures of different types of crustose lichens. Um, and if we go up to the upper right-hand corner to the diagram, you can see what's different here. We have uh, you know, the same thing with our nice upper cortex. It's defined algal layer, fungal layer, but there's no lower cortex at all. And that's because with a crustose lichen, it actually lives within uh, the substrate that it grows on. So I think studies, it can, it's gone up to 16 millimeters into its substrate, the lichen can grow. So that's over a centimeter. Um, so no distinct lower surface. Um, it may have a painted on appearance if you're just looking at it with the naked eye and you cannot um, separate it from what it's growing on. If you wanted to collect one of these lichens, you'd have to take a big chunk of um, whatever it was growing on to get all of it. Now we're gonna talk about fruticose. Um, these are our big showy uh, Lichens, a lot of people recognize these. Um, they can be erect, um, pendant, shrubby. Uh, they can have very thick stalks um, or they can be wispy as hair. Um, but if you're looking at it under the microscope, um, fruticose lichens don't have an upper and lower cortex. They have a cortex that goes all the way around um, because they're more stalk-like. So um, if you cut it and looked at uh, down the stalk of lichen in a cross section of a fruticose lichen, you'd see cortex on the outside and then an algal layer and then a fungal layer in the middle. And we'll talk a little bit more about the anatomy of this in another section. And the last growth form we're gonna talk about is squamulose. Um, so this is kind of in between the first two, um, kind of in between folios and crustose. Um, I like to think of it as shingles on a house. It's basically, you took a bunch of tiny folios lichens, a bunch of really tiny lichens and uh, put them all together to where they overlap. Uh, like shingles on a roof of a house. So if you can look at my little diagram in the upper right hand corner, it looks like the folios diagram, but a lot smaller and turned up on its side. Um, it'll have on the microscopic scale, it'll always have a distinct upper surface, um, but sometimes it will not have a lower surface. 
Um, but yeah, you can see in these photos and they're kind of hard to tell with scale. So these are taken through a um, hand lens. Um, you can see how they're tiny little scales all overlapping one another. So lichen colors, um, this is one of the cooler things about lichens. These two pictures are the exact same species. Um, this is the lungwort lichen. Um, on the left, it's completely hydrated and on the right, it's um, really dehydrated. So lichens get most of their color from the algal layer. Um, and when it becomes dry, it becomes colorless or brown. Uh, but lichens are really um, interesting in that they can uh, survive extreme uh, periods of water loss. So they can have absolutely no water for over 30 days. But as soon as water is available to them, they can absorb it very quickly and begin photosynthesis again in just a matter of minutes. So this um, technique is called pokekilohydry, and I spelled it for you right here if uh, you thought I you know, was sneezing, gazoon tight. Um, but uh, so this gives lichens an amazing ability to survive. Um, very extreme conditions. This is why we find lichens in some of the most extreme habitats um, in the world. Um, but just to give you an example of what they can handle, in 2005, um, the European Space Agency actually sent some lichen specimens up into space and they exposed them uh, to the temperature fluctuations and cosmic radiation of the space environment for 15 days. Um, they brought them back down to Earth and gave them some water and they instantly, um, within a few minutes again, just began to photosynthesize like uh, they had never been up in space. So really cool um, ability of lichens. And we'll open it back up to some more questions. Um, I know that those kind of subjects, uh, people are always like, whoa, hold up. <laughs> Um, so Elizabeth was wondering if the types vary by the region. Um, well, just a moment to get this all set up. So I wouldn't say that the types of the growth forms of lichens vary by region. Um, I would say that um, fruticos and folios lichens, so our leafy lobe-like lichens and our ones with little stalks or can be wispy or hairy. Um, they are more abundant in places that are more diverse in plants, um, have higher quality air, um, cleaner water, and then crustos lichens and squamulose lichens um, are a bit hardier and can survive uh, in more abundance, um, you know, being like really harsh environments or polluted environments. Um, so I don't really think it's by region, but maybe just by other environmental factors. Um, and is there a type, I'm looking at the questions. Um, Elizabeth asked if there is a type that I, I see more in Kentucky. Um, no. Not really. Um, well, I guess there is a lot more diversity in the crust species. Um, so maybe I could say that there's more crusts in Kentucky. Um, I can't say that definitely, though. Uh, we're still exploring Kentucky flora, but that's what I'm going to say for now. <laughs> And then uh, Kathy's got a question in the chat. She was, it's two parts. Uh, the first part is how do they reproduce? And the second part is which type happens because of the algae and fungi present? I'm not quite exactly sure. Um, so the reproduction question, I'm gonna put off cause we're gonna go over, uh, we're gonna have a reproduction section later in the talk. Um, so I think you're asking what determines the structure, 
I hope, I think if I understand correctly, so um, the fungal component would uh, determine the physical look of the lichen besides the color. The color would probably be more determined by the algal component. Okay, and then there's one more question here from Jenny. Um, <clears throat> is Spanish moss an example of fruticose or is it actually a moss? Hmm. I don't know the answer to that question. It definitely looks like a fruticose lichen. So yes, you're right about the form um, and how that looks, but there's no Spanish moss in Kentucky. And I'll be honest, I haven't um, ID'd it. I think it is a lichen, but I don't, I don't wanna be wrong. <laughs> um, so yeah, I will, I will have to get back to you on that one. So there, there are actually two more questions now. Do you want to? I'm, I'm fine with it. Okay. So um, from Faith, do you see a particular type oops, uh, more often in the city? And could I find any or some types in my backyard maybe? Yeah. Um, I definitely, there's tons of crustos lichens in cities. Look on sidewalks, on uh, buildings that have been there for a long time, metal, glass, plastic in cities, they, lichens can grow on anything. I'll talk about those substrates later in the talk. Um, but you can find lichens anywhere. I see lichens any and everywhere I go. So um, later in the talk, I'm gonna talk about uh, the different places that lichens grow and the substrates that they grow on. So hopefully that will uh, an answer your question better when we go to that part of the talk. And then Elizabeth has another question about um, the air quality, air and water quality for lichens in Kentucky. How is it? Um, <clears throat> I would say that it varies by region. Um, there's so many factors that go into it, um, but some of the more diverse hotspots are those places that are conserved um, and protected from disturbance. So LBL, Sorry, Land Between the Lakes, um, Mammoth Cave National Park, Cumberland Gap, the Pine Mountain area. Um, so I'd say there's, there's no universal answer across Kentucky, but there are certain regions where things are a little more high quality um, on the natural environment side. Um, and those places would, uh, would be more habitable for lichens. Okay, and then um, there's an update from, from Dawn, who um, actually works at the Arboretum, so she's, she's good for this. And Eric, um, according to Wikipedia, they are both saying that Spanish moss is an epiphytic plant. So in the bromeliaceae. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we got good, that good thing, good thing I put a, a little bit of doubt in there, because I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I learned something new. Thank you. Okay, is that all of the questions right now? I think so. Yeah, we'll go ahead and uh, go to the next uh, section. I'm gonna say my connection's a little spotty, so I'm gonna turn my stuff back off. Okay. So now we're gonna go over um, some lichen anatomy, um, some things if you were to uh, pick up a book about lichens or read some stuff online, uh, just some anatomy terms you might come across and what those mean. Um, so we're going to start with rhizines. Um, so rhizines are an extension of the lower cortex. Um, and since if you remember, foliose lichens were the only ones to ha consistently have um, a lower cortex. Uh, so usually you only find rhizines on foliose lichens. Um, so on the right here, I made another little diagram. Um, so they're not like a different kind of cell. They're just uh, pieces of the lower cortex that have extended out um, to the substrate. And generally they're just used for attachment. Um, a lot of people ask if uh, they are akin to roots in vascular plants, um, and they're not. Um, we haven't really seen that 
they use their rhizines to um, soak up any nutrients or anything from the substrate they're on. And uh, usually they don't even, the rhizines don't even um, have much an effect on uh, the substrate and don't cause much damage at all. Um, so rhizines, there are many different kinds. Um, I drew these little uh, examples for you guys of just some of the kinds you might see. Um, in this photo, we have simple rhizines. This is a really big lichen. So this is one you can uh, see the rhizines with the naked eye. Um, so all right here, all on the other knee. Um, this is a dog tooth lichen. Um, so those are simple rhizines. They can be dichotomously branching, which just means they branch off in twos every time. They can be randomly branching um, and they can be squaros, which is where you'd have one main axis of rhizine with little filaments coming off at almost 90 degree angles. Um, there are some other kinds, but these are the, the main ones that um, you'll see. So rhizines uh, can be used to ID species, um, their presence, their absence, um, are they all distributed evenly over the lower surface or do they only occur in a certain area of the lichen? Um, are they dense? Are they sparse? So just uh, one of those things you'll become familiar with as you start uh, looking at lichens. Another thing um, you might see while looking at lichens is a powdery covering on the surface. Uh, this is called pruina. So this uh, photo on the left was taken underneath the dissecting microscope. Um, so you guys could really see what it looks like. Um, so these are basically crystals, um, crystalline de deposits or dead fungal cells um, on some lichens um, that are just deposited on the upper surface. Um, so on my little diagram here, they're not connected to the upper cortex. Um, they just sit on top, the little blue powdery bits. Um, a perina can look um, white like it does in the photograph here. They can be gray, blue, uh, yellow, orange, uh, different other kinds of pigment, um, but most of the time they're white. And usually um, there's some kind of deposit like calcium oxalate or um, some secondary uh, lichen metabolite that just gets excreted out. Um, so usually the presence and absence of uh, and the location of Purina are used to help ID lichens. So the next, um, anatomy term we're going to talk about is cyphele. Um, and that's just a fancy word for hole in the lower surface. Hold on, I'm going to take a drink really quick. <clears throat> but it's not just um, a hole in the lower surface. Um, they, if you look at my little diagram on the right here, it's a hole in the lower cortex, but it also has um, a lining of specialized cells. So when you look at these um, in the naked eye or under um, a microscope, they're very large craters. You can tell there's definitely a pit or a hole. Um, they have a lining that's usually white and the base of it is usually white or whatever color the fungal layer is. Um, you usually only see these in moon crater lichens. Um, and yeah, I don't think you'd see them in any other species. And those are rare lichens that only occur in the Pine Mountain area in Kentucky. And, and maybe some older, more high quality forests and protected lands. Um, but we talk about Cyphele to talk about the evil twin sister, but not really. Um, the pseudo Cyphele, 
um, the one disguised as a whole. So this is just a break in the upper cortex. Um, there's no special lining of cells. Um, it's basically the upper layer and the algal layer just had a break um, and the fungus just kind of popped through. Um, so it's not a true hole. There's no specialized cells on the side, um, but they can be white like this. Um, they can be different shapes. Uh, they can be dense, they can be sparse. Um, it can be all different colors. Uh, so those kinds of characteristics um, would be used to help ID uh, your lichen to species. Maculae um, is the next one we're gonna talk about. This one is a little tricky um, to photograph. So I don't have the best photos of this one, unfortunately. So this is where um, the algal layer is not continuous underneath the cortex, but there is no break in the cortex. So if you can see right here by these red arrows, there are these white sections in the lichen and there's nothing wrong with the lichen. There's no break there, uh, nothing happened. There's just a missing section in the algal layer that creates these white lines. So the presence, uh, the abundance, the location of maculae um, are also something you can use to ID lichen specimens, the species. So um, Pedicia and squamules, um, these are unique to fruticose lichens. Um, this might look like we took the squamulose lichen diagram from before and the fruticose diagram from before and just kind of stuck them together. It's definitely what we did. Um, so what I showed you before was just a simplified version of um, this. This is, the, this is the, the, the bigger picture, the true picture. Um, so this stalk that we see here is called um, the pedicium. Uh, we can just call it pedicia since we're talking about multiple. Um, and it is a extension of the sexual structure. And I think our next section is sexual structure. So I'll go over the sexual structure in a minute. And then the squamules exist um, at the base of the pedicia. So some fruticose lichens almost have two different um, parts and components, but it's all still uh, the same lichen. Part of it is just vegetative and part of it is reproductive. And so we'll open that up for questions now. There are two questions here. Uh, Jennifer is asking how many species of lichens are there? Um, in Kentucky, um, I'm guessing you're asking, um, being honest, we're still figuring it out. Um, lichens are one of those, um, groups of organisms that are a little bit understudied in Kentucky. Not a lot of people become experts in lichens and not a lot of people have in the past. Um, so the last few years, we've really been upping our knowledge. And as of the end of 2000, I'm sorry, uh, as of March, 2020, um, we have 618 species of lichen in Kentucky. Um, but that number will probably go up um, as research continues. All right, the next question is from Alan. Uh, what do the specialized cells on Cyphele do? Um, I don't know that they have um, some kind of special function other than that they line um, the cyphele um, and that they're there. And um, it's just kind of a marker that these are cyphele and these are not pseudo cyphele. Um, 
So really it's just a ring of protective fungal cells. Um, and I guess at the basics of it, it would then be to maintain the function, I'm sorry, maintain the form of the cyphele. Looks like that's it for now. Okay, we'll go on to the next section then. We're gonna talk about uh, lichen reproduction. So making lichen babies. Um, we'll start with asexual reproduction. Um, and one of the biggest uh, ways that lichens do this uh, are these structures called ceridia. So uh, the red arrows are pointing to big clumps of ceridia on this lichen specimen. Um, and a ceridia is basically a group of algal cells with a bunch of fungal filaments wrapped around it. Um, so this is basically a little lichen baby package um, that the lichen makes and puts somewhere on its surface. Um, they can be on the edges of the lichen, sh like shown here. They can be completely over the surface. Um, they can be underneath. Um, they can be distributed all kinds of ways, um, but mostly um, they are a way um, of mechanical dispersal um, of lichen, uh, little lichen baby packages. So I'm gonna show you guys exactly how this would kind of work. Um, so mainly for Ceridia, it's theorized that they are wind dispersed. Um, since they are so light, they can be as fine as flour. Um, so here's our, our parent lichen with all of its ceridia, with all of these little ceridia exposed to the elements. And hopefully a good gust of wind comes by and carries some of our ceridia to a new substrate. And hopefully the conditions are good on this new substrate and this little ceridia can tuck in and over time it can create a, um, a new lichen growth. So there's debate as to whether to call this new lichen growth um, a new individual lichen or a clone of the parent. Um, it's a little bit hard to tell and it gets even more complicated um, a little bit later. So we'll go over that in a minute. Another um, form of lichen asexual reproduction, um, lichens use these uh, structures called isidia. And so I'm pointing to them with these uh, red arrows here. So just like the ceridia, they're algal cells wrapped in fungal filaments. Um, but the difference here, they have a cortex covering. So just to remind you, the cortex is fungal cells that are tightly packed together for protection. Um, so ascidia can look like they do in the photo here where they're all simple um, and just sticking straight out from the lichen surface or they can be a little bit like my diagram here where they're very branched. Um, and so these are distributed mechanically also um, through wind, um, animals walking over them, splashing raindrops. Um, so to just show you a little bit of what that looks like. Um, I use the snail as our uh, lichen distributor here um, because there's a really cool paper for all you science nerds out there um, about how snails and slugs are responsible for a lot of the vertical distribution of lichens on trees. Um, so I asked uh, our zoologist Shelby Fulton for a picture of a beautiful Kentucky snail to um, distribute our acidia for us. So this, this photo is from Shelby. Um, I didn't get the species of snail, sorry. Um, 
But so our snail would walk over our lichen, probably have a little snack of it, and our acidia would break off and stick to the snail. The snail would go about its business, sliding down the tree to a new um, location, and that acidia would fall off of the snail. And over time, um, hopefully if conditions are good and it can tuck in there well, uh, there will be new lichen growth on that substrate. And again, is this a new individual? Is this a clone? Um, it gets kind of confusing. So how it gets confusing. Sexual reproduction. Um, so apothecia um, are our means of sexual reproduction. There are different types of apothecia. Um, I'm gonna go over that uh, in the following slides. So we talked how there's a fungal and algal component to lichens. Um, only the fungal portion reproduces sexually. And it does that um, by uh, producing spores that are formed by uh, meiosis and fusion of gametes. Um, so within a, like in apothecia, uh, you would see these ascospores, which um, are basically little containers for our fungal spores. Um, so if you wanna see what that looks like, they're so, so tiny. This is a photo I took um, on my microscope at max uh, magnification. Um, and this little red circle here is one ascospore. Um, so basically this is if you took the apothecia and we're looking at just this top section right here. So obviously my drawing is not to scale, but there's a bunch of these ascospores in an apothecia and then all the fungal spores um, are in there waiting uh, to be ejected. So how do they uh, disperse their spores? I have another little diagram here. So within the apothecia in the asco spores, pressure will build up and eventually the pressure becomes too much and the fungal spores um, will be ejected from the apothecia. So once ejected, these fungal spores have two targets they can go to and successfully uh, create new lichen growth. They can land on a suitable species of free living algae. Um, so they could land here and begin uh, to form a lichen or they can land on an established lichen and take over the um, algal component and therefore take over and create a new, uh, new lichen growth. Um, kind of like being a parasite almost. Um, so this is where it gets really interesting when there's an established lichen and a new fungal uh, spore comes in and takes over um, the algal portion and starts to create its, uh, its own individual. Um, quite interesting stuff, uh, still not completely clear um, in the scientific world. I guess we don't all agree um, on what a new individual and what a clone is in lichens. So I'm going to show you what um, some of these apothecia look like. Um, these sexual structures. The most common um, I see are these disc apothecia. So this diagram up in the right hand corner would be if you were looking at an apothecia um, from above. So the margin of the apothecia, which you can see in the photographs as well, that is um, cortex. So just our upper cortex. Um, like before, so our tightly packed fungal cells. And the um, structure that holds the ascospores and fungal spores is called the um, hymenium. 
And so that's the center of the disc with the coloration you see here. Um, so these, when they look like little discs, they're often um, likened to jam tarts, um, which I think is pretty cute. So <clears throat> back to the, um, this slide again, just to remind you, you know, we talked about the Padisha and the squamules. Um, we talked about how the Padisha is just an extension of the lower sexual structure um, tissues. So that sexual structure is an apothecia um, and it can uh, grow up top a, a Padisha, so like a stalk and more of a glob instead of being a disc. So here's some examples of these. Um, these are usually pretty colorful um, and, you know, eye catchy. Um, so there's a British soldier, um, it's a really cloud, uh, sorry, crowd pleaser on the left here. Um, yeah, these are, uh, most people notice these when they go on hikes just because of their, um, their dashing colors and their uh, 3D form. The next um, sexual structure we're going to talk about is <clears throat> parathesia. So these are basically apothecia in hiding. Um, they're an apothecia that hides underneath the surface. And so all you can see, and you can see with these red arrows, all these dots are just the top um, hole of the apothecia where the, the fungal spores would come out. Um, so yeah, these uh, occur in all kinds of lichens. And sometimes if you look, this is the surface of a rock, uh, the lower right hand photo. Um, you'll see all these little holes in the limestone here. And that is actually uh, the empty ones or where there used to be parathesia and um, they reproduced and then died off. And when they died off, they just fell out of um, the rock and actually left a little pit there. Um, so I've always found that really interesting about parathesia is that they can eat into rock. <clears throat> um, another type of apothecia that um, is pretty common um, are lyrilelli, which um, funny way of saying um, basically a stretched out apothecia. Um, so I have two photos of them on the left here. Um, they almost look like writing. Um, they're often akin to like uh, Arabic scripts. Um, so if you looked at a normal disc apothecia from above, there's that little diagram from before. A lirilelli is basically one that you took and stretched out. Um, and they can be, you know, really straight like this, or they can be very branched like you see here. And again, they're doing the same um, sexual reproduction function. And now we'll take some questions. I think we just had one. Oh, here's another one. So um, Eric was wondering about, can lichens be grown in a lab? Um, as far as I know, no one has been successful in growing a lab lichen yet. Um, I could be wrong. There could be some cutting edge stuff that I haven't seen yet. But as far as I know, um, there hasn't been much success in growing lichen in, in a lab. OK, and then another from Mason. Um, is there a particular species or certain family of fungi that help make a lichen and are the fungi saprobic? Um, so the majority of um, lichen fungi uh, are in the um, Ascheomycetes. I think I said that right. Or, and a few can be in the Basidiomycetes. Um, my Latin is not that great. Um, so sorry if I just butchered that. Um, oh, got more questions. Okay. Does the type, I'm just, I'm 
grab some of these questions. Um, does the substrate affect the type of lichen that grows? Um, to a degree, um, I'm not gonna go too much into it right now because that's, I'm gonna cover that in um, another section um, in a little bit of length. So yes, um, but uh, I'm gonna wait on the rest of the answer. Do you wanna read this one, Josie? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's just dumb luck if the fungi lands on the right freestanding algae during sexual reproduction. Do they choose common algae? Do they have multiple species they can use? Um, so right now, the understanding is it's not so, I, I did say species when I was talking about it, but it's actually not so specific. Um, so what has been um, found is that it's more genus to genus. Um, so you'd have a certain uh, genre of, of fungi, a certain genre of algae. Um, and when they came together, they could make a certain species of lichen. Um, that is the current understanding, um, but there's still, there's still a lot to be learned. And I think we only really started doing genomes of lichens and getting more into the understanding genetics in like 2016. Um, and then Elizabeth was asking, is there a device like a microscope that you use to look at lichens in nature? Um, I use, I wonder if I have one, I think I have one right here. When I'm outside, I uh, use a hand lens. So, sorry, it's like tangled up in my headphones. So it's, um, it's just a little, little lens that you look through. Um, but this is, uh, I think, 15X. Yeah, this is 15X. You can get these um, pretty much on Amazon or any kind of online retailer. Just look up uh, like botany hand lens. And I recommend uh, oh, like a, a 15X or higher. Okay, thank you. I think we're good on questions. Okay, um, I'll go into the next section. Okay, so where do lichens grow? Um, we're gonna go over the known lichen substrates. Um, so, sorry, you guys might hear my cat a little bit. She's um, getting interested. Um, so lichens cover about 7% of the planet's surface um, and they grow on a wide range of substrates and habitats, um, including some of the most extreme conditions on earth. So uh, the first two substrates we're gonna talk about is bark and wood. Um, and when I say bark, I'm talking about wood that is living still. Um, and when I say wood, I'm talking about um, dead, dec decaying wood in, you know, a forest or um, wood that you made a structure out of or a deck out of and it's been uh, processed and is sitting there for a while. So not all bark is the same. There are some chemical differences between um, conifers and deciduous trees. Um, due to the organic resins and gums in conifers, they tend to be a little more acidic. Um, and then conifers usually um, are evergreen and have foliage all year round. Um, so, you know, that lichen might be protected more on a conifer from rainfall or wind, um, harsh weather. Um, so some lichens are really specific to the kinds of trees that they grow on, or even um, like the genus of trees they grow on. Um, and some lichens are uh, generalists. So when it comes to wood, um, 
Lichens that usually like to grow on bark or living trees usually <clears throat> do not grow um, on dead wood. Um, if they do grow on both, they're usually just um, a generalist species that is just extremely hardy. Um, but generally there's a pattern that if it grows on living wood, it does not grow on dead wood. <clears throat> Some other uh, lichen substrates, um, moss and dead vegetation. Um, so lichens can colonize those things, especially if, um, excuse me, if it's a, a moss that's sickly or not doing so well. Um, so you can see that in the uh, center picture and um, you can see on the left, uh, a lichen that has grown on some um, pine and cedar needles. And then um, lichens can actually grow on, um, on leaves, um, which is really, really interesting. It's a, mo a more abundant thing in tropics where <clears throat> the trees um, have leaves that you know, stay all year long and are really hardy um, and have a really nice thick waxy covering. Um, the only species of vascular plant that I know of in um, Kentucky that uh, has lichens that grow on its leaves are the rhododendrons. Um, so rhododendrons in Kentucky, once those leaves get um, four or five years old, uh, you can sometimes find lichen growing on them. Doesn't hurt the leaves. Um, or anything, but it's just something really interesting that you wouldn't um, think about. So unfortunately, I didn't have any photos because it's pretty rare to find um, that lichens on rotor leaves. Uh, so hopefully uh, you guys don't mind too much. Uh, so rocks and soil. Um, most rock dwelling lichens um, have evolved to really only inhabit like a certain kind of rock. So um, if it grows on sandstone, it grows on sandstone. Uh, if it grows on limestone, it grows on limestone. You really don't see many um, species that do both um, or do multiple kinds of rocks. Um, and same thing uh, with soils. You have all different kinds of soils. Uh, lichens will have uh, those same kind of preferences. Um, if it grows in acidic soils, it probably won't grow in basic soils. So human made materials, um, lichens don't just stick to nature, they can really commandeer a lot of ma different materials. Um, something that's pretty interesting, um, they, lichens grow on human made materials that are the most similar to their natural substrate. So for example, Lichens that grow on glass um, might normally grow on like a silious rock. Um, if it grew on cloth, it might normally grow on soil or dead vegetation. Um, if it grows on leather, it maybe it uh, grew on wood. Um, if it grows on metal and plastic, uh, it's probably grows on rocks or is just one of those really hardy generalists. Um, so that that's always interesting to me um, that they're still so specific. Um, and then there are even animals that lichens grow on. So I know this picture is a little bit blurry um, on the right. I'm sorry about that. But this is um, a lacewing larvae. So they produce these sticky uh, silks so that they can attach lichen bits to their backs. Um, and basically use that for camouflage. And while they kind of collect um, they're like in bits. In New Guinea, there are weevils that have specialized um, texture on their back to promote uh, lichen growth and lichens actually do um, grow on these special textured spots on their backs and again they use those for camouflage. So the growth of lichens. Um, Lichens usually grow outward. Um, 
with the new growth coming off of the outer edges of the lichen. Um, so looking at this lichen, on the left here would be our new growth. And on the right here, this, this blank spot would be where there's already starting, uh, some death is starting to occur. So this lichen probably started growing somewhere close to this, the bare spot on the right, and it's been growing outwards radially um, for years. Um, lichens grow very slowly. Um, they're really regular in their growth rate, but uh, it can be as slow as half a millimeter a year. Um, but some can grow up to five centimeters a year. It's just kind of dependent on the species and um, the environment in which that species uh, is in. So, um, how old are lichens? Uh, it's pretty cool. They could possibly be the world's uh, oldest living organism. Uh, this uh, species right here on the left is Rhizocarpon geographicum, or the map lichen. Um, as far as I know, we don't have this one in Kentucky. Um, I took this photo on Roan Mountain in North Carolina. Um, but it's, it's close by, it's in our neighboring states. Um, but there was a specimen of this in the Arctic that they um, dated at 8,600 years old. So that would make it the uh, world's uh, oldest living organism. So the complicating part about it is, you know, did it start as a new growth and just growing all that through time? Or was it a lichen and then fungal spores fell on it and then it started a new lichen? So that makes lichen aging a little bit confusing and difficult. Um, and there's still a lot of debate as um, how to define lichen aging. Um, one thing I, a lot of people ask are what are lichens good for, um, for so many things. So I thought I would go few, uh, through a few of them for you. Um, the first one is soil formation. Um, lichens are really the colonizers of rock um, and they can grow down 16 millimeters into that rock. Um, and eventually over time, they will produce chemicals, um, the fungal bits will expand and contract um, and cause the rock to just slowly, slowly erode into soil. So they're uh, a really big component in our soil formation, um, as well as soil stabilization. Uh, this photo in the middle is um, diabetes, um, Basiomyces, uh, and it is a really common lichen on sandstone soils that um, all this gray that you're seeing are fungal um, filaments that are going through the soil and they actually um, go deep, deep down into the soil and keep it stable, keep it from eroding. Um, they hold moisture in the soil. Um, the fungal uh, filaments actually reflect the sunlight, so they keep the soil cooler and then help retain moisture that way. So they're doing a lot by just uh, being in the soil some places. Um, tree colonization. So like on the right here, you see this tree is just covered in different uh, lichens and mosses. Um, so when it rains, a lot of the times a tree can't retain those uh, nutrients and water for an extended amount of time. It just kind of dries up um, off of the bark. It doesn't just flow down to the roots. It'll, it will evaporate. Um, and lichens will hold on to that water. And there's actually research that in some forests, the uh, delayed release of, of lichen water after 
a weather event um, actually helps maintain the humidity um, in some forests. So um, they're doing some really cool, um, interesting stuff there. They can also hold on to um, nutrients and then later leach them out down the tree into the roots. Um, so they can do a lot for the trees that they grow on. Um, their role in the nitrogen cycle. Um, lichens with blue-green algae can take nitrogen from the air um, to use. Uh, then when that lichen um, begins to die or decay, uh, the nitrogen can leach out into the soil and then plants can use that. Um, lichens are food for a lot of animals. Um, reindeer, mule deer, white-tailed deer, mountain goats, uh, flying squirrels, uh, <coughs> excuse me, voles, um, moose, uh, mites, springtails, silverfish, uh, slugs, snails, all kinds of things um, depend on lichens for food. Um, nesting materials, there's over 50 uh, species of birds in North America that have been documented using lichens in their nesting materials. And then um, for camouflage, uh, a lot of small insects use lichens for camouflage. We have that uh, lacewing larvae in the middle here again um, that puts lichens on its back uh, to help it blend in with the trees it uh, inhabits. And then in the bottom right here, we have the uh, English peppered moth um, using its dark coloration and spots to blend in with the lichens around it. So the status of lichens in Kentucky, this is of uh, March of this year. Right now, um, or in March, as of March, we know that there are 618 um, different species of lichen that are native to Kentucky. Uh, but like I said before, that that's, that's probably going to um, rise a little bit as research continues. Um, so um, the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves has been working with Moorhead State University since 2017. Um, to figure out uh, the scope of the lichen flora in Kentucky and figure out what our rare lichens are and which ones we should be conserving. So preliminarily, um, there are 60 different species that can, uh, could possibly be state listed um, and one species in Kentucky that's um, globally rare. But again, with more research, these numbers might change. And just to show you uh, the work that's been done over the last few years, this is um, from 2017 to the end of 2019. Um, and just as the blue gets darker, uh, <clears throat> there have been more lichen observations in those counties in Kentucky. Um, we still have a far uh, way to go if we wanna catch up to vascular plants, but um, we're on our way and um, I'm hoping to inspire more people to look at lichens so we can get more um, eyes on, on the trees and the rocks in the ground uh, to get more observations and more data on lichens. So that is the end of my talk. So I guess we'll just take questions now. There are two questions here. Um, can lichens regrow over areas it has died? Um, I'd say yes. Um, it might not be the same individual, even though the same individual is kind of hard to define. Um, but another lichen could definitely grow there. Right. John wants to know about apps. Is there an app you would recommend to best ID lichens? No. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, um, there's not really an app. Uh, the, the 
best thing I could say is to get into iNaturalist um, and use that some. Um, lichens are a little bit behind um, in the technology, um, IDing um, technology stuff. So I can recommend a really good book, um, The Lichens of North America by Brodo. Um, but uh, I hope that someday that there will be a really cool app to help um, ID lichens. So Lynn is asking, what is the impact of the yard care chemicals found in many Lexington yards? Um, hmm. That's, I mean, it's kind of hard to say in general, you know, chemicals like that are going to damage lichens. Um, but I don't, at the same time, lichens that are growing in cities um, are usually generalists. They're more hardy. Um, you know, they can take uh, harsher environments more, so maybe they're fine. Um, I don't know. Uh, someone, someone should uh, do a study on that. <laughs> And you've answered part of this next question, but um, Faith asked, do you have any favorite lichen books or articles to recommend in field guides? So maybe elaborate on that. Yeah. Um, the Lichens of North America by Brodo, like I said before. Um, trying to, there is, I have a stack of books behind me. Um, Another good one to start out, it's probably going to be backwards, but uh, the common lichens of northeastern North America is another good one. Um, besides that, um, I can't really think of too many articles, um, uh, but websites, you could go to the Consortium of Native, uh, sorry, Consortium of North American Lichen Herbaria, um, which is basically like an online herbarium of lichens. Um, and um, I'm always uh, a resource to reach out to um, if you ever want ID help. Is there a way that you recommend people get in touch with you to do that? Um, yes, could, is there a way I could send my email or put it somewhere? Oh. I can just put it right down here in the chat and I think everybody can see it. Yeah, right if you could here. just put my, my work email. You wanna just say that out loud so I- Yeah, it's, it's um, kindle.mcdonald at ky.gov. We can also send it with a recording. Okay. We go. Yeah. So Elizabeth is saying that she loved your talk. Um, she was trying to interpret the map and her question is, what do lichens look like in Eastern Kentucky? So Eastern Kentucky, um, especially when you get into the mountains, some are, you know, one of the biggest hotspots for lichens in the state. Um, so, oh my goodness, they're, they look all, all kinds of ways. Um, in Eastern Kentucky. Um, I've seen lichens bigger than dinner plates. Um, I've seen some of our rarest species um, in Eastern Kentucky. Um, so I would say colorful and impressive and amazing is how they look in Eastern Kentucky. <laughs> All right, so I have a question um, regarding uh, lichens and iNaturalist. Um, are there um, people out there on iNaturalist that regularly ID lichens, and if you're posting pictures of lichens, what um, what kind of pictures do you recommend that people post to iNaturalist? Yeah, um, I actually run a project in iNaturalist called the Lichens of Kentucky. Um, so if you post um, a observation of a lichen in Kentucky, it's automatically going to go into my project. Um, there's really only a couple people in Kentucky that are IDing lichens on INAT, um, but there are several um, hobbyists and naturalists from other states that um, are on iNaturalist. Did I answer all of the question? 
Um, well, the other part was as far as like photographs that people should post, oh, yeah. should they be from different angles? Yeah, I would, um, you know, get, get a picture of the entire specimen and then lots of close up photos. And just lichens are one of those groups that it's just kind of difficult to ID them sometimes, unfortunately. Um, and sometimes all the photographs in the world can't um, help you get an ID because um, you would need to put it underneath a microscope or do chemical tests on it to uh, confirm a species. But usually through photos, I can at least get you to a genus. What was the group again that you, um, an iNaturalist, what's the name of the project you? It just uh, lichens of Kentucky. And Alan is asking, where would you go for a uh, lichen looking near Louisville? Hmm. I'm trying to think, maybe Bernheim. Um, Otter Creek Park's not that close. Um, but yeah, anywhere that there's an, a nice um, stand of forest or places with rock outcrops. Um, once you start looking for lichens, they're everywhere. Um, so it'd be kind of hard for you to find a place where there wasn't any lichens. Um, so yeah, I'd say just, just start looking. Um, natural areas are the place to start. Um, Freddie has a question. Uh, I noticed some of the counties in Kentucky have many more observations than others. Why and how do you report your observations? Um, so why? Um, it's basically, I pulled all the data that I could, um, that I could find. Um, historic data, um, data from Moorhead State University, um, observations, I've seen observations um, that I could identify on iNaturalist. Um, and some counties don't have any observations just because nobody has, um, submitted any kind of record ever. No botanist ever went there um, and collected lichens and put them into an official collection. Um, no lichenologist has been there and taken pictures and put it um, on the consortium website or on iNaturalist. So it's just, it's, it's the wild west of biology. Uh, we really don't know everything. Um, that's out there yet because we just haven't been able to look at everything. Um, so it's really cool that um, the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves has taken an interest in lichens and documenting that um, and figuring out where Kentucky is. So long answer, short story, um, we just don't have enough data yet and we're working on it. <laughs> And so it, like um, maybe Freddie's asking if she wants to report observations, is iNaturalist the best or do you have um, That's what I would do unless you're interested in a more formal process um, with a lot more uh, steps and work and um, things like that. And then you would need to get in contact with Alan Risk at Moorhead State um, since he has the only lichen the only active lichen herbarium um, in the state. But otherwise, iNaturalist is a great, uh, is a great way to document lichens and I um, glean a lot of information for that for our database. Thank you. All right. Okay. Oops. Did you see another one there, Beverly? Well, I'm seeing something um, in chat. Um, Jennifer says the field of lichens seems to be very much a niche study. How did you become interested in lichens? Is there a recommended way to transplant a lichen? If I found an interesting specimen, could I transfer it somehow to a tree in my yard? Um, so yes, lichens are super uh, niche and I kind of, it was kind of a happy accident that I got into lichens. Um, 
my because of scheduling issues my professor had to put our local flora class in the spring instead of the fall so that mean meant that the first few months of class there were uh no no plants with leaves really um for us to go out and look at so he had to get creative um and he was um into lichens and mosses so he just ended up um using lichens and mosses uh to cover those those winter months um and i just kind of fell in love with it um so that's how i got started in it there are so many parts to this question what was the second part um let's see is there a recommended way to transplant a lichen Ooh, that's hard um i don't know that once you remove a lichen from where it's been growing probably for decades, um, how well it's going to live um, once you transplant it. And I don't think there's been much success in um, viable living transplants in lichens. Um, not saying it's not possible, but I just don't think um, it's been done yet. I don't see any other questions. Elizabeth had a couple follow-ups, but I think they probably got answered. I hope so. <laughs> got some nice comments coming in too from Caroline and Abbott, or I'm sorry, Caroline and Alan. Um, great job, Kendall. Thanks for presenting. <laughs> this was great. Thanks. This is awesome. I love to share the like and love with everyone. Um, and uh, I hope I've sparked some interest in a couple people. All right, thank you all for coming. Uh, we can hang out for maybe another couple of minutes in case there are any other questions that arise. Um, we really appreciate you all joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks guys. Thank you, Kindle. It was great. Let me figure out how to uh, save the chat this time because it. So um, from Elizabeth, I, I was, still wasn't quite sure if we got to the whole question, um, she typed in, where did this go? I typed every option, did not work, please share a link. Um, not sure which one that was referring to. Okay. Maybe um, the project and I naturalist or? You might have to elaborate for us, Elizabeth, or, or maybe uh, send us an email. Yeah. I'll share with you. There is a, another question um, from Jenny and she's asking to speak. So I'm going okay. to do that and while we wait for Elizabeth to chime in. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, great presentation, Kendall. Thank um, you. Yeah, um, my question was if uh, cyanobacteria symbionts kind of act the same way as the green algae symbionts or is it are they mainly aquatic um they uh they act very similar to the green algae um the only real difference is of course they're you know a different species but um they can fix nitrogen the mm. blue green algae can uh, and green algae can't so and do you ever see terrestrial lichens composed of oh the... yes yeah oh, all the time. okay very cool. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not um, just an aquatic thing. And most lichens actually can't um, handle being underwater or super wet for super long because the fungal elements in them will break down. Oh, okay. That's very interesting. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good question. I think it may, the question for Elizabeth is she has the app and nothing comes up on lichens, but um, basically she would need to search in her in projects to find that project. Um, and again, you called it. Um, it's just lichens of Kentucky. Okay. And or and she it, post in within that post. Yeah. Well, if I have the parameters set up for the project um, that if anyone posts anything that could be a lichen, 
um, and it's in Kentucky, it goes into the project. So um, people don't even have to do anything. They just have to post. Um, but uh, Elizabeth, it might be easier uh, to find the project if you look on um, the desktop version of iNaturalist, because um, I know the, the mobile version um, is kind of reduced in its function. Thank you. All right, I don't see any other questions coming in. So I think we can wrap it up. Thank you, Kendall. Thank you so much, Kendall. This is really wonderful. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love it. I love doing stuff with you guys. Appreciate it. Maybe thanks uh, everyone for attending. I hope we can do another uh, in-person hike with you at some point. Maybe Same. yeah, definitely. All right. Take care, everybody. See ya.